just two weeks behind Knox Johnson, he continued eastwards for another lap of the Southern Ocean to save my soul, as he put it. This is the real solo race, sailing like it's 1968. Forcément, tous les gens qui reviendront de la Golden Globe Race, forcément, il faut s'attendre à ce qu'ils aient changé. It's a great story and it's the 50th anniversary and it's a great opportunity to relive the original solo sailing when technology wasn't available, where we're just using sextants and uh, wind up clocks to find your position. And it's really the story of humanity and human endeavor in the extreme. So the world has never seen anything like this event. Well, good day, everybody. Um, this is an unusual live for us. This is three silly solo seniors, and I have a bit of a chat about um, sailing and the GGR and uh, anything that comes up. I've got a list here of subjects that we're going to pull out, and uh, we'll uh, uh, just see where it goes. I'm not quite sure. So I'm going to bring up Captain Coconut uh, without any further ado. We all know about Captain Coconut, GGR extraordinaire in 2018. G'day. <laughs> How are you? How are you doing? I'm good. One time I'm good. no see. Exactly. In fact, you're only about you're about tw uh, 10 miles or 15 miles uh, that way for me. I'm in Adelaide and so are you. <laughs> Just down the hill. Yeah, exactly. So... Um, Anyway, you're looking a bit small back there. You're right. You're looking too relaxed. So, what okay, have you been doing? Go. What? You, um, what oh, working. I'm, I'm working, and um, we're um, um, uh, preparing for a survey of the um, of the uh, Gulf St. Vincent, um, a, a, a hydrographic survey for nautical charting. So. Um, um, yeah, um, I'm uh, sort of uh, planning, planning, but uh, paying some bills along the way, hopefully. <laughs> okay, so that's surveying. Just for people who don't know, you're involved with a survey company, but it's pretty interesting because you're using a remote control, another an autonomously controlled vehicle that's going to just set out and go and do all the charting Ooh, by itself very soon. You got that? Uh -oh. uh, yeah. Yeah, we've um, we've developed um, an autonomous um, vessel that will um, that's controlled from a parent vessel, and it works alongside yeah. it, so we can cover twice the ground at the same time. At the you know in in the same amount of time, so it's uh, an opportunity to um, um, you know bring some new technology to bear, which which should improve our productivity, um, and um, but it's still a very much a seamanship activity you know, it still needs to be managed properly and okay. uh, and whatever so you know all right so i'm just going to right now bring in our special uh, guy because uh, robin's just ticked off and made a cup of coffee and our nord's just turned up now our nord being our only french entry in the ggr 2022 here he is now good day our nord how are you hey. <laughs> I'm fine, thank you. Hello, everyone. That's good. Hey, we you got to you got to move over a bit. That's it. We want to stay central. So, um, so good to see you. Oh, yeah. I will speak slowly because I know you're French. Um, so tell us where yes. you are and what you're doing right now. I'm. Um, I am in my boat in Les Sables d'Olonne, and uh, I'm prepared. Gently, the the race. Okay, and you're on the Vendée Globe Marina right now, right? Over Vendée Marina. Yes, yes, I, I am on the on the marina of the on the Vendée Globe ponton, ponton, and uh, it it is a, the right place. You you want I, I show you outside? I could move my computer. Oh yeah, if you want to, we'll see if this works. I yeah, could. go for it. Um, 
I know there's nothing there because all the meetings are just gone. <laughs> so this, this, this may, may not work, um, but we'll see. It'll be a big empty marina. It's uh, it okay. is a yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's a bit hard um, to see. You're too close. Hang on, I'll get rid of cap coconut. Um, um, okay, that's a bit. <laughs> okay. Hard. Okay, and I'll I'll do a running commentary because I know the place. But the the marina was full of minis just a few, few hours ago. <laughs> yes, all the minis go out a few a few a few hours ago. I, I go back to my office. <laughs> yeah, there was about 17 minutes there. I'll, yes. bring, I'll bring Captain Coconut back in here. But oh. there was, uh, there he comes. Okay, yeah, there was um, yes. 70 odd mini class mini 650s there a few hours ago, and they're all now roaring down the coast yeah. in perfect sailing conditions on a big race. So, okay, I know. So, you're our only French entry. How does that feel? And we're going to do the big interview with you next week. So, this is a quick grab. But what's it like being the only French entry in the GGR? It's it's a big surprise for me because of in my idea, they they must have uh, four or five French for this uh, race. But is that yeah. it? <laughs> so you you'll have a big reputation to uphold after Jean Luc. Yes, <laughs> I, I must win this time. <laughs> yeah. And so, so how's your boat? What do you have to do to your boat generally? Like, what's the plan quickly in the next two years? Just a short overview. Um, uh, I have to, I have to change all the, the gréement. It's uh, the, the rig, the rig in English, the the wind pilot and everything to to make it uh, perfect to to do the race. A lot of lot of job, but uh, I, I make a special planning for that. Yeah, and you're chasing sponsors. Good place to be to find a sponsor on the marina. <laughs> yes, yes, and and it's uh, it's very lucky for me to to be the, the only French for the moment, because uh, I uh, I show every people to I say uh, I am the only French in the race. Then if you want a French uh, to, to sponsor a French uh, in the race, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good line. I like cool. that. <laughs> All right, so we're going to um, we we'll look forward to, we we'll look forward to having a big chat next week, eh? You want to say anything, yes. Mark, before I sign off? No, good, good to see yeah. you, Arnoud, and look forward yeah, to good catching too. up in the future. Yeah, you okay, too. Great. Time, okay, all right. Thanks for coming on, Arnold, and we'll see you next week. Bye for now. Au okay, revoir. with pleasure. See you. See you. Bye bye. Au revoir. Yeah. Okay, so now we can get into the nitty gritty. If Robin's still there, there he is. There he is. So we got a coconut, and we've got another old bloke here. G'day, Robin. Hey, Robin. Yeah. Good day. Good day, everybody. Good day, uh, Mark. Good day, uh, Jane. And uh, oh, Don, you're there as well. Hi. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> yep. Yep. As usual. As usual. So where are you now, Robin? Still in Cleveland. Um, Still doing maybe uh, early, early September, I'll be on my way back to England. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Flight, All flight right. Got, flight got cancelled. <clears throat> oh, really? Yeah, I, I actually booked to Europe and they've already cancelled it once and rescheduled, but I'm still arriving mid-September, so that's cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, challenging times. Is the virus getting close to you there? Like it has every, the area around you. What's the story? It's, you know, I mean, uh, uh, you you don't know where it is. I mean, really, when you actually think about it, being in a, you know, an urban area, then, you know, our area around here d does have quite a bit of it kicking around, I guess. And um, yeah. it's just the case of wear, wear the damn mask, sh you know, sit down, shut up, stay at home, wash your hands, stay away from people, put a mask on. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? A mask is pretty easy. <laughs> Anyway, okay, so look, here's the deal. I've got a list here of uh, 15 different subjects, and so we'll just see how long this takes to develop and see if we can have some fun and pass over some knowledge. And I've put a sequence here. They've all got numbers by them, so we don't know how far we'll get. But anyway, first subject is you're in the ocean, in the GGR. What's your daily routine? 
you literally, what's the day-to-day life on board? What are you doing? Uh, Captain Coconut, you go. Yeah, well, um, generally, uh, um, you, I, I um, before the before the race, I was talking to Jesse and uh, Jesse Martin, and one of the things Jesse said was that when he w- went around the world, he didn't change his clock all the time, and he left it on GMT the whole way. And I thought, you know, I think that makes a lot of sense, and so that's exactly what I did. So your life is very much governed by the sun. And so, you know, you, um, you, 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 you do, and, and I, I, all my astro was all sun sites, the whole lot, sun run sun. I do a, a morning sun, um, sometimes two, um, um, sun run sun, Meridian Passage, afternoon sun, whatever, I, you know, do little jobs during the day, blah, 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 but, and, and maybe read or do whatever I was doing. But at, um, as soon as it gets dark, it's dark. And, and, you know, there's only so much you can do. And I don't tend to huddle up over a, a light. So I tend to, if it's dark, I go to sleep. And But I'm sort of up every 15, 20 minutes. I probably have my sound asleep at about dawn, just before dawn. And I might sleep a little bit heavy there. Invariably, if I set a little alarm at night, I generally wake up five minutes before it or get up anyway, even if it's, I said, 15, 20, 25 minutes, depending on what's around. Invariably, I'm up and about before it. I need to reset it. But basically, snoozing during the night, sailing and doing sun sights during the day and watching the world go by, really. (laughs) Okay, well, that blew my theory. You covered about three or four subjects then in one minute, so I guess we're stuffed now. (laughs) <laughs> but anyway, um, you're right. When it's when it's night time, it really is dark. I like that. It's very uh, a very GGR statement. You know? uh, so, so uh, Robin, what's your daily routine? You know, how's it all happen? Well, I I keep GMT time the whole way round. I don't uh, I, I don't uh, have dual clocks. I just have GMT time, and um, you know, I mean, if you start from you know. When it gets light, that's a good time to have a little check round just to make sure everything seems pretty good, you know, as it gets light. But I, I tend to sleep in little bits, morning, noon, night, any time at all. If I feel tired, I go and have a sleep. So, uh, but yeah, yeah. generally, probably a bit more sleeping is done at night than during the day. And, um, you know, it you really build your 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 life and daily routine around your priorities. And you know, one of the priorities has to be sleep. Another priority has to be eating and drinking. You know, and the other big priority has to be um, repairing stuff. So, uh, you know, that that's really what the day revolves around. And at the same time, the obviously the biggest priority of all is to keep the boat moving. Yeah, exactly. I I used to be very uh, cosmopolitan, you know. I would same as you, Robin. I get most of my sleep at night time, and I read about all the Vonday guys and this that. Now they're saying they're only sleeping fifteen minutes at a time. It just blows me away. I used to have a wind up timer, and I'd very rarely try and get less than an hour sleep. But you'd have cat naps without the alarm, you know. You you just cat nap when it's all relaxing, just to well, you know I, get nothing else to do. I, I don't I don't cat nap. So much as if if I'm going to have a sleep, I'm in the bunk. I'm out flat. And remember, on my boat, I've got yeah. this very, 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 very comfortable bunk. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I'm the same. I used to usually. I'd, I'd never sleep longer than two hours. Wind up the egg timer or whatever it was. You know, uh, it was a, an oven clock thing. Wind up timer, and I'd go down two hours at a time. But during the night, you'd get up all the you know all the time. You know, about two hours or ninety minutes and check check around, stick your head in the bubble, look around, write the log, have a drink, get back down again. But it's all broken. But once dawn comes and you have a good look around the boat and shake out the sails, whatever you're doing, yeah, I was like, Mark, the biggest sleep you have is early morning. Once once the flight and you you know you can relax then. <laughs> yeah, anyway, that's that. all cool. Yeah. Okay. So number two on the list here is uh, where the bloody hell is number two. Um, let's talk about wet weather gear and clothing. Um, you, you, what are you doing for wet weather gear and clothing, Robin? Um, dragging out my old stuff from the nineteen nineties at the moment, but yeah, I'll just. Go. Are you still? Are you still using it? Oh yeah. You're still using it. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing because hey, I've got stuff that goes back that far, 
and I would I'd still be using it. You know, like it's um, yeah. But you've had you've done three rounds. Yeah. Well, and and at the moment I've, I'm I'm still I'm still wearing my '98 guy cotton uh, uh, stuff, but that's starting to get a bit uh, you know not quite as good as it needs to be anymore. So. I've dug out of the container here that will be in my suitcase to take take back to England with me, the old Heli Henson from 1994. That will see me through this winter. And then, you know, next year I'll get a good a, a good new set, um, you know, for the race. You should just sign them and try and sell them off at the dock. Who wants to buy my, uh, you know, uh, historic wet weather gear from 1998, you know? <laughs> well, maybe I'll have to auction my old stuff. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so you're just using the typical three layer system, underwear and middle layer, and and so on. Yeah, pretty, pretty much. I mean, I'm, I, I absolutely hate being cold. So, yeah, if if the gear isn't good, you're going to get cold. You're going to get wet. You're going to get water coming in, and I absolutely hate it. So, uh, you know, especially down in the down in the you know south where it's a bit on the colder side. So. Uh, you know, good good gear is is uh, is as important as anything else. Yeah. So, what are you doing, uh, Captain Coconut? Yeah, look, I um I got for the last one. I was um, I was supported by Musto, and I got three sets. I got a light set, a medium set, and a heavy set. And the heavy set was all three layers. The medium set, you know, normal sort of stuff. And then there was some light stuff. To be to be honest, because we started when, when did we start? First of June, wasn't it? Um, July. So it first was, of July. First of <laughs> July, right? So we started. We headed south and whatever. It got more and more and more. It wasn't until I got to about thirty south that I even put it on for the first time, <laughs> because it was all summer heading south, equator and whatever. And then you're in the trade. Or you're in the the, the, the north uh, northeast trades in the southeast trades, and then one morning I got up um, coming in the southeast trade. Like, you know, it's a bit cold. <laughs> <laughs> so I just bought the, the medium ones, and that's all. So the the heavy stuff hasn't hasn't even been worn once, only for photographs. The medium stuff the whole way through, and uh, I'm just going to use use that. Uh, the, the, that stuff for the next one. I did use the the lighter stuff uh, once or twice, um, and, um, and and that's just sort of you know, shower proof and whatever. But it, it's the but it was funny because when um, when I got to um, Australia and it was it was December, um, the day before I invent I entered Investigator Straight, I was still wearing all my gear, um, and then um, entered Investigator Straight, and all of a sudden it was hot just out of nowhere and, and you know then coming up uh, gulf st vincent it was um, oh the day after i arrived i think it was 40 degrees in adelaide yeah you know, we're doing um oh. press interviews and whatever and it was thinking, oh. i go two years ago two days ago i was wearing all this gear and um because in the, the oceans you know the, the southern yeah. ocean it was freezing but it, it, it wasn't you know you, you wore um a, a jacket all the time just just for the warmth yeah what about you know, what about gloves what what did you think What'd you do for gloves and hands? Um, oh, look, I I um, um, didn't. Here's here's a here's the thing, because I got my half dodger, um, and because I've got my um, winches within sort of reach and whatever, and I've got all my um, uh, jam clips for all the halides that come back. I'm doing nearly all my stuff sitting in the companion way there, and so I'm out of the weather. I'm out of the weather, and and, and I've got this yeah. this um, compen- this combing around me and wrapped around my back, and in heavy weather I've got this, the the thing um, zipped around behind me. So in in a way, I'm I'm sort of um, I'm only putting that. So I'm just sitting there with with sort of like um, um, thermals on or whatever, um, um, you know, in, in sort of like long johns and that type of stuff. I'm just wearing yeah. that all day, and it. If I have to step outside, then I'm actually putting my jacket on because I don't want to get my long johns wet. Invariably, I put my jacket on, nothing on my legs, and then I actually get my spray. I get all my legs wet, and that annoys me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't get wet. Yeah, you must have been your cockpit set up. It's just crazy. It comes up to your armpits and 
you can run the whole boat. It's a little bit like Blondie Hasler without the, the full cover, but it's pretty impressive in a lot of ways. Oh. Anyway, what, what, what were you doing for gloves, uh, Robin? Gloves? Oh, I've got loads of gloves. I, <laughs> I, the one thing I really hate is having cold hands or cold feet. So socks and gloves, very, they're, they're terrifically important. And I've got, you know, several sets of, you know, what you call ski mittens. I've got, you know, musto leather gloves with thermal liners and all sorts of stuff like that. So I've got a pretty big bag of uh, just, just a big bag of gloves on it, just gloves. Yeah, what's your favourites? Because I always had trouble keeping them, keeping them dry. You know, I had all sorts of problems. You know, with the skin peeling off, and my hands were always wet, and and so on. But what's your favourite gloves? You know, the Southern oh, Ocean. Pro pro probably my musto gloves, the, the 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 leather ones with the little thermal liners, and I've got lots and lots of thermal liners for the for the gloves. So once once they get wet and the hands feel cold, I'll chuck one set of liners out and put another set in and stick my hand back in and I'm away good to go again but listening to what Mark was saying about coming up to Adelaide there and the temperature how it was cold and then all of a sudden it got warm you know that reminds me of each time coming up past Tasmania to Sydney you see you know in the BOC where yeah. you know it, coming coming through Bass Strait I was still in the full Southern Ocean gear you know all the heavy stuff yeah. all the thermal yeah. and you turn the corner and all of a sudden the sun comes out and, and you're going from full thermals to a pair of shorts in about five hours. Just like oh, yeah, that. Yeah. Bam. It's amazing. Yeah, that's normal. Uh, uh, your musto gloves with the thermal liners, they're golden oldies, right? You've had them for a long time. Yeah, and funnily enough, yeah, I... Yeah, don't even make it anymore. Well, <laughs> then I've got to look after the ones I've got. Absolutely, because I had the same ones. But anyway, they were great, eh? Anyway, that's another story. All they right, so really uh, what have you got here? We're going to jump around a bit here. We've got weather reports um, and weather instruments. How are you? How are you analysing the weather, Robin? When you when you've been going around, you know, like what are you using? Yeah, right. <laughs> you see, you've been there, done that so many times. You're, you're a bit like me. I've only done one circuit, but I spent a long time in the Southern Ocean on ships, back and forth, back and forth. And when you know it, it's you don't need a lot of information to understand it. Would you agree with that, Robin? No, you probably don't. You you you. I mean, it really boils down to absolute basics, but fundamentals, you know, if you understand, yeah. you know, your lows and your, you know, barometer and what direction the wind's coming from and what it's changing to, you, you've really got a pretty good picture of what to expect. Um, you know, if, if we had absolutely no weather whatsoever information from anywhere, that would be just fine. I mean, you know, you, you, if, yeah. if your fundamentals are good, you know of, of meteorology then then you should be good good to go i yeah. mean and i'm sure mark uh, you know is even even more switched on about weather without you know all the fancy electronics and weather reports than i am yeah it, it's it's my pet subject because um i tend to agree you know and i'm a big bar paragraph man but yeah basically a barometer wind direction rate of change and uh, just looking at the sky, you know, you can tell when the front's about to hit you, you know, with the clouds, you know, it all clears northwest, southwest. And you've really got to get a feeling for that basic fundamental principles of how the Southern Ocean works. And I really think what happens, Northern Hemisphere sailors don't get it yet. They've got to reverse their thinking. But you, you don't have the Southern Ocean in the North Atlantic. They're static, you know, bouncing off the bits. You're in you know, any GGR entrant that hasn't studied and understand the Southern Ocean weather before they get there, it goes beyond getting weather reports. And I saw some things going on last time that you know you could just tell they they you know some may not have fully comprehended the way it works. It's pretty simple, but it, it needs to be instinct. That's my opinion anyway. And I always use a bar well, a barograph down there is great. And a barograph also acts as a, a bit of a record every time you get knocked down and rolled over. <laughs> you can see the go you know get the, the paper recording. But what's your story? Uh, 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 Mark? Well, I, I, um, I, I think there's sort of like a, a hierarchy of, of managing it. And, and firstly, there's the kilometrological data um, and you, um, so, which, which, is, which is well tabulated in, uh, what was that, what was that book that we were, we were given before the, uh, the race? Oh, the pilot started? charts, Jimmy, Jimmy Cornell pilot yeah. charts, they were really yeah, cool. Cornell, right. So, in, in, in a way, you've got the statistical data there. So I think 
I think, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm sure I operate quite conservatively, but but I think that's the starting point is that because then then you know, you know, in general what's going to happen, um, and and so, you know, for, for example, for example, if you want to look at the original GGRAs, right, and 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 they started off at the original same time. Original in sixty eight or eighteen, sixty eight. Uh, 68, 68 yeah. right? So they started off when, when we started off. They got down to to um, um, to um, what was it? Um, uh, what are those islands near Gough Island in the uh, the bottom of the uh, the South Atlantic, right? Tristan, and then Tristan, 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 yeah, got the, the crap knocked out of him, and then um, and then um, Bill King got the crap knocked out of him. Uh, Lloyd Fugeron got the crap knocked out of him. They all got the crap knocked out of them. They arrived there at that time, and it was really quite predictable. And I think, and when we headed down there, because the the leaders were heading faster, they got in on even sooner. So in in a way, you know, the um, the heading heading south of um, of, of um, South Africa and going around the bottom of the Agulhas, there there are, there are two elements of it. There's the climatological data about what what's going to happen to you at that time of year and then there's the weather what's going to happen in in the shorter term and, and as you say the the difference between the southern hemisphere and the and the, and the northern hemisphere is is it it, it it can blow in the southern in the southern ocean and the sun shining <laughs> yeah exactly we all know about that a, a couple of things, a couple of things there. it's a sunny day doesn't mean really, it's a good day <laughs> yeah absolutely um, a couple of things there, all the entrance for next time and people that are interested, you can work out the average speed of the boats, you know, from leaving the Saab alone and getting down to Cape Town and around the bottom. And you can dummy that up. In, on, the race will now start on September the 4th. So this year, it's September the 4th. You can start plotting your own journey and, and going around and watch the weather you're likely to get, you know. So you've got one dry run this year and then you'll have another dry run next year and it's invaluable. It's very interesting watching it. And, uh, uh, you know, I think we'll find we're going to get a better run, hopefully, touch wood, uh, this year because we're starting a lot later. Um, so, anyway, yeah, I, I just got the public comments up for grabs here. Uh, uh, so, good day to everyone who's watching, which is kind of cool. Um, Gurav saying, saying uh, what's your best socks? What, what, what are you wearing for socks, by the way, um, Mark? Well... A special thing here. Auntie Claire has knitted some very <laughs> special socks. They're all very colourful and they're all very large. Okay. And they kept you support. What about <laughs> you, Robert? What, worse than, you yeah, know, I've, I've got no good socks. Terrible. That's, you know, and uh, yeah. nice. I've, I've, got, I've got a load of musto socks and a, and a, uh, a load of... Um, knitted you know wool ski socks and you know again there's just like there's a bag of gloves there's a bag of socks yeah look i was on coconut on the week on the weekend you know so I'm, i know what his answer is going to be but what do you what do you wear on your feet in the cabin because the cabin sole usually gets wet and uh i know what i used to do you know because it used to be a pain in the ass but what do you do on your feet inside the boat robin Oh, I, 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 and unless I'm getting in the bunk, I uh, uh, keep my boots on most of the time. Um, oh, right. You know, if I'm if I if I'm you know, uh, I, I I like to have some some trainers that have just got snap on, uh, you know, Velcro straps. They're easy to get in and out of. And you know, I set you know my 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 foul weather trousers are set up round my boots and are all you know. Uh, dog down round 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 the boots so that I can just step straight into my trousers into the boots up comes the uh, bib and away I go you know yeah I'm the same that's the fireman trick I did the same but I'd get out of my pants in the wet area and get into like Ugg boots and different things but uh, now tell me about uh, unfortunately the the sad occasions Mark when you happen to wet your carpet down below <laughs> oh, well, I thought you were going to say what? I, I thought you were going to say wet his pants down below at most for a no, moment. No, he does that when the carpet gets wet. He's got to get the vacuum cleaner out and clean the bloody carpet. <laughs> yeah, look, um, people were laughing at me because I got carpet down below. But I'll tell you, 
<laughs> carpet is a very good one. It, it, it doesn't, it's sort of like non-skid, really good. And it, it, it's actually very, very durable. And um, um, and uh, when it gets wet, I, uh, I rip it out and take it on the upper deck on, on a sunny day and dry it out. So I've got three areas, really. There's, as you come down below, next to the galley, um, and that area tends to get a bit wet. And the reason by, why is, is, is you, all my outlets, my bilge pump outlets on the, on the companionway combing, um, even though they're a long way out of the water, you wouldn't believe it, they spend a lot of time under the water. And all outlets can work as outlets or inlets. So unless you've got cocks on all of them, it means I actually get water in the bilge coming in my bilge pump outlets, even though they're, they're high up on the company. Which means at extreme angles of heel, it slops up the side and wets the carpet. So that's the problem there. By my bunk, that bit stayed nice and dry. But then in the forward cabin, the um, the uh, inlet from the um, uh, from the dunny, um, when the the salt water inlet, when I'm on the port tack, was leaking. But I thought it was the window that was leaking, and I spent all the rain silicing up this window and i've only just worked out that it was the flow okay. pump. okay getting getting back to socks mike mike and mike lewis had just mentioned a trick that i do sometimes as well um he's saying big thick woolly socks and just get some silicon and run the silicon along the bottom and let it go off and you've got non-skin socks that sort of uh seal up i do that on gloves sometimes big woolly gloves just go through and they're great non-skin gloves so yeah that's an adelaide trick oh mike's from adelaide too but anyway another story okay so uh that's enough about that let's talk about comms um and uh you know your communications and radio receiving like how you're going to get your weather reports uh, how are you going to talk to others on HF radio and things like that? Um, ham radio is now being knocked out for the next race, of course. But what are you, uh, being a radio operator, Robin, what are you going to do? What radio set and what receiver and all that sort of stuff are you going to use? I don't know. I mean, I'm still looking around and thinking about it at the moment, you know, and the most productive thing to do is to stop thinking and start doing, probably. Um, <laughs> oh, you, know, you don't have I, an HF radio, do you, at the moment? You've only got the HF. Yeah, I haven't got an HF radio on the boat at the moment. I haven't got an HF receiver. So, you know, when I go sailing again, you know, in the winter or the early spring, when it, when when the boat goes back in the water, then, yeah, we'll, we've probably got to have an SSB on board. Um, you know, I, I may just, just find a, a you know, a, a, a secondhand M700 um, and... You know, if that works out, you know, that's fine. Uh, uh, otherwise, we'll just grab a, you know, a new icon. Um, you know, I mean, the, 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 yeah. the, 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 the icon sets, for example, are very reliable. But I had a great Furuno uh, in, the, in the back in the, in the, in, in the you know, 98 race. Um, you know, so I'll, I'll look around and see what's around and, and, you know, may, I may end up with two of them. So I've got a receiver and, uh, you know, one I can use as a receiver and one I can use as a transmitter. Yeah, I, I actually, uh, in the BOC, I used a, um, a smaller ham radio as my mandatory receiver because they're good. But this, I stumbled across this the other day. It's been around for ages probably. This radio I just popped up now is the ICOM 718. It won't meet the race rules for your primary set because it's only 100 watts. You have to have 125 watt. But this is a full all-mode transceiver, and uh, some countries allow it as a legal marine unit. In other words, it's got all the ham frequencies, transmit and receive, as well as all the marine frequencies. In Germany, they can op they'll open it for you, and you can use it in Germany. In America, it's a bit grey area, whether it's legal or not. But um, on, e on eBay now, I just saw one. I just checked we came on, 350 bucks US. And it's a great receiver. You know, any old ham radio is a good receiver. So, uh, which which, uh, which yeah. one was that one again? Was that oh, the Yeezy? That, that one's the no. It's an Icom Seven One Eight. Okay. The Icom Seven One Eight. It's just mm -hmm. unbelievable. You can still buy them brand new. They're they're about five hundred and five hundred and thirty euro or something. But you can buy it. They're, they're always up second hand on eBay for about three hundred fifty bucks US, which is amazing. So so uh, tell us about yours. Uh, Mark, and um, whether you had fun on the HF or what? Yeah, um, look, from when we when we left Le Subdelon, I, I just found that um, just BBC on short 
away, got me all the way down to Gibraltar, which was fine. And then you're in the, the, the northeast trades. You don't need weather reports, so you're just in the northeast trades. Cross the equator, you just got to do that. You don't need weather reports for that. And then you're in the southeast trades, you don't need weather reports for that. Then, <laughs> then, uh, Cape excuse me, excuse me. I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just laughing here if Mark Slats is listening or, or Jean Luc or, or any competitive sailor. They'll say, What? You don't need weather reports? Yeah, what's going on here? That's the difference in attitude. You're in uh, category three, uh, Mark. But we'll talk about that later. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> right. Now, what, once you get to the South Atlantic, Cape Town Radio. Now, very, very, the, the beauty with um, the South Atlantic, well, in fact, um, even the North Atlantic for that matter, it's divided up into nice little areas and the, you get separate reports for each area. And it might be, you know, you've got Marion, Crozet, Cape East, Cape West, St. Helena, blah. And they're really neat little pack, little areas that you're in for about a week or so. You get the thing, you write it down um, and the... Um, They'll chat to you, mate, Chef. So I, I used um, Cape Town Radio the whole way through there, and uh, they'd even take a message for me. Um, and then once you uh, um, you get to um, Amsterdam on the other side, um, you've got then Walloon and Charleville Radio in Australia, and they provide um, the forecasts for that that area. The problem is though, is that the areas there are much much bigger. So when when you're, when you're in the area of Cape Town, you divide it up. And if you're not worried about Marion South or whatever, you don't have to write it down. You just write down the ones that, that you care about. But when you're in the uh, the Australian one, that, that, that area west is absolutely huge. And there might be, you know, two high pressures and four low pressures and a couple of fronts and the fronts of all the lats and longs and whatever. And you're writing down for a whole quite a long time because it's only after then you can work out which bit of that forecast is relevant to you. I don't want to listen on the fly and then go, oh, shit, I should have written that down. It's too late. So I tended to find South Africa was really good because it's all divided into areas. The others were, were you, you've got to write it all down, and it's still quite good. And I, I, I didn't get past Charleville and Walloon, so I don't know. Um, <laughs> Like you, you, you're one of the guys that understands radios because you're coming from Australia as well, of course. But, I mean, you could have had a cassette tape player with good old cassette tapes and recorded it. That's what I used to do back in the back in the GTR. But we had the weather facts. We got weather facts this time. But, you know, one thing I would say is that, that, that we tend – and Robin's a radio operator. Mark, you're from Australia. We use HF radio in Australia, or we did. Um, but in the in the north, you know, in the European countries and stuff, they don't need HF radio. And and I'll still maintain that. And hopefully, the guys this time will understand that their HF radio is going to be their real friend, and they need to get oh, it yeah. sorted out. And it'll be very valuable. The weather facts is going to be a plus, you know. And they'll still they still it's part of GMDSS the weather facts. You know, they're still you know pouring out all the maps. You know, fishermen are still using them, but they use a black box. We've got a printout, so you don't have to use a computer. Um, but anyway, it'll be interesting. Um, you happy to have a weather facts, Robin? Yeah, I'm happy to have a weather facts, especially you know if 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 there's um, you know some you know so, some areas have weather facts and some don't. You know, down around Australia, it's going to be very valuable. Um, uh, around Cape Town, you know, uh, and and you know, right at the beginning. Um, you know, coming across Biscay, it would be useful to have a fax map. Uh, there's not a lot of great coverage down around Cape Horn and South America in particular, but, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, any, any tool is a useful tool if we're allowed to use it. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so um, uh, we're, time's going okay. So, oh, juicy one now. We've got uh, droves, warps and storms. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it sounds to me, Mark, that you didn't have much use for droves, warps and storms during the race. You seem to do all right. What, what, what's your take on it at the moment? Tell us about your tyres. Are they radial tyres, by the way, or are they just straight five-ply? <laughs> uh, well, then, then you one. Because when I got to Australia, there were these young guys who were sailing over to um, South America, so I gave them my tyres to, uh, um, to go away with. So I had to get a, a, another couple. Um, which I get from my local, local car servicing place. Look, I reckon they're really good for a couple of things. You can sit in them 
so they're really quite comfortable. You can store the anchor chain in them, so it, it, yeah. it, 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 it's really good. Um, and the, 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 I think the, the issue is is they don't slow you down and touch. And all, all I like them for is they just orientate your bum into the sea, and that's all you want. You want to keep going, but just orientate the boat. And I, I just found them quite very, very easy to deploy, very easy to recover. Um, uh, just kept the, the stern um, into the waves a bit and, and so sort you, of was, was helpful. Um, you, when, when you're using your tyre, you just run one rope through it and just loop it. So when you're pulling it in, it's a two to one streaming through the inside of the tyre? No, I just tie, put, the, put a line through and tie a bow line and chuck it over. And, and just That's stream it, yeah. a, a single line. Now, the only thing wrong is you'd think it would tow very neatly. Well, it doesn't. It goes round and round and round and round and round. And so it will unlay the rope. So since then I've got these big, <laughs> heavy fisherman swivel. So I'm going to put a swivel in and I'm going to have a bite of line that goes through, do, do my bow line, tie it onto the swivel, and then I'm going to tow the swivel on the line because it, it really... Um, 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 started to unlay the rope and whatever, and then forever it's a bunch of bastards when you're trying to coil it because it's been wound so much. So fisherman swivels, I, I really like. I got them in. Um, where did I get them? Um, oh no, I, yeah, I um, I think I got them in La Subdolon actually. Um, but yeah, they're, they're big, heavy. Uh, uh, no, no, I got them in Plymouth. Okay. Um, um, yeah. Before so, how, so you, you're starting to sound like an advertiser of the series Drogue with all these real bunch of, you know, <laughs> but I don't want to mention that word because everyone mentions that word. Um, but how often did you chuck your tyres out the back and how expensive, how much did the tyres cost you? I know it was expensive, you know. Yeah, they're freebies. <laughs> oh, the only thing is you need, you need, you need small tyres. You don't want to get yeah, a yeah. normal car tyre too big. So you've got to get don't a worry, car tyre... Off a, off, a, off a little Toyota Corolla or something like that. Nice small yep. wheel. And, um, so how, or a how often car. did you use them? How often did you chuck them out? I used them twice. When, when I was sandwiched in the Agulhas against the coast, I hove two, so I didn't use oh, them yeah, there, I didn't have room. And I think there were two occasions where I, 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 I streamed them. But, look, to be honest with you, to be honest with you, I, th I think you need to sail around the world to know how to sail around the world. And my 157-day <laughs> little thing was a really good yeah. practice. So I know how to do it now, I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, another so good GGR line. When it's, when it's night, it's dark, or no, when it's black, and, and you really need to sail around the world to sail around the world. I like that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, so Robin, what... I like them. Yeah, I'm going to take a minute. My little boat, my first little cruising boat, I carried a little tire that I painted white to make it, you know, a bit more acceptable as a drogue for three years, but I never used it. But anyway, that's another story. And what's your take on it, Robin? I, I, I'm a big believer in just get get the boat moving and keep it moving and keep it moving fairly quickly, um, just not too quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, and if 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 all else fails, I'm I'm I've got I don't know, eight hundred foot of warp to to you know tow as you know as just tow warps. Um, yeah. What I will carry for for drogue value is um, a, a, a portion of heavy fishing netting because that's going to give a good drag if I were to you know uh, tie yeah. that on the end of a drogue something like that. It probably needs a bit of weight to weigh it down a bit, and and so on. So, um, yeah, you know, it's it's a case of try it and see at the time. You know, I mean, yeah. in my previous boats, I've towed warps, and 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 they've worked well for me. But you 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 still do need to you 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 still need to keep some decent speed up. When I was dismasted and going towards Cape Horn, I had several, you know. 50 60 knots you know southern ocean storms and without the windage of the boat you know the mast and and yeah. everything else without that windage you know i was beginning to think well you know the, the and i'd taken down the storm sails that i'd got for my jury rig the boat just wouldn't track with any with any speed so 
I ended up putting putting back up my emergent, you know, my my uh, uh, storm jib, and and just sailing on, even though it felt at times I had too much sail up. It was a lot safer to have the sail up than than you know not not have enough uh, windage to carry the boat at a decent speed. Yeah, yeah, I must admit I've never set a drogue in the Southern Ocean. <laughs> and I've gone fast and slow and knockdowns and rollovers and stuff, but yeah, I I just think that's the way to go but everyone every sea is different every skipper's different every boat's different so there's no right or wrong you know that's the big thing an awful lot of it is you've just got to go out and try it i mean you can read all yeah. the books you want but you know if, yeah. if you're you know when you're out in the when you're out in the in the atlantic i mean like pat lawless is out there you know going for a sail now you know when you get in us in in you know 30 or 40 knots of storm try it put, put out whatever you think you're going to put out and just give it a little go take it in but if you're lucky you'll get yourself in 40 or 50 or maybe gusting 60 out in the north yeah. atlantic try these things because if you don't try them it's too late to, to, to do the learning experience when you get down in the southern ocean kind of thing yeah exactly um mike lewis just brought up an interesting point mike's done a couple of little one and a half second navigation, two second navigations via Southern Ocean and uh, Cape Horn as well uh, in a 37 foot ferrous cement boat, a uh, long story. Um, and he's saying you can always um, retrim the boat, shift gear to the stern, uh, you know, better to be pooped than pitch pole and so on. I always thought that, um, particularly with uh, Eastfarn, you know, Eastfarn knows exactly what he's doing, had a great boat, this, that and the other. But I always used to notice his boat was a little bit bowed down trim sometimes, you know. And there's probably something to be said for that. Keep some weight at the back of the Southern Ocean, whatever. Um, kind of interesting. Gurev wants to know if there's a prize for the first Aussie into Adelaide. Uh, no, there's not. <laughs> all the Aussies. Uh, keep on going. We have a full fleet of Aussies in this race, so they're all going to go. Okay, so um, uh, moving right along, number six is harnesses, use and jack lines clipping on and a helmet. Did you take a helmet, Robin? A helmet? No, I, 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 no. I, I, I no, um, no helmet. And uh, I'm, I'm not really thinking of taking a helmet, but um, I, I yeah. guess you know some people get their heads banged quite a lot. Um, <laughs> Happened to me at you ninety. Know, that's no that day, you know. <laughs> okay, so what about uh, what about your harness and jack lines, lifelines? Because you know there's something really interesting happened that I quite often listen to Sailing Illustrated. If you haven't seen, it's a great. Uh, blog. It's a lot about high tech racing or or performance racing. You know, America's Cup and all sorts. But they put a lady on to give an interview. She got washed off the boat off her boat in America in a race. It was in the lakes, I think. And the bottom line was, it was the one thing. Some years ago, on your safety line off your harness, they made it a requirement to have a snap shackle on your chest, right? Which I've always rejected that concept. Have a snap shackle. Anyway, she was snap shackled in with a, with a regulation harness, and uh, she gets swept out of the boat with some others on a jibe, and da 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 da. And the snap shackle just undid, right? Um, and you know, yeah. it just happens. You get everything wrong, and it goes boom. Um, so tell me about your harness, Robin, and the type of uh, lifeline and the clips that are on it. I've I've used I've just used the, the 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 harness that's within the within my you know foul weather jacket. That's that's oh, yeah. that's what I've always used. And um, uh, it's, it's it's got a you know a thing on it you know that you hook on with and and, and so on. So. so how often do you use it? <laughs> when not, it's hot? Not not very often, unless it unless it unless it's particularly rough and. And yeah. so on, you know. If if you've got to think, well, it's a bit, it's 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 a bit rough and bouncy out there. Then you know, yeah, you you you'd better, you know, do some hooking on. The problem I find with hooking on is it, it then gets in the way of the of the ropes and your ability yeah. to move around the deck. So I tend to feel generally, you know, one hand for the boat and one hand for the job that you're doing, and just an an, an absolute constant awareness in the head that you're not hooked on yeah, and, yeah you know you just have to be very 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 aware and um you know switched on to that yeah it's always in your mind i know i always imagine imagine if you're off the boat and you watch your boat sail away but you know there's some interesting subjects there too because i'm probably maybe a bit more clipped on than you are robert but i'm not clipped on a lot of the time 
and uh, I always remember in the uh, in the eighty six BAC when we lost uh, Jacques Deru uh, coming into Sydney, and uh, when you know there was all sorts of theories, but when they they slipped the boat once the boat got back to port, you know we went and got it. Uh, there were these marks down the, the side of the hull. I don't know if you remember this, but very much like a whale. And I always imagine, okay, you know your boat, you're not clipped on, that's fine. You've got the motion, but something unusual happens, like hitting a whale, upsets the motion and you're gone. That, that's one thing, but everyone to their own choice. And the other one is that that covers up this whole issue of um, if you end up over the side in average conditions, say off the bow, and you've got like a metre freeboard, and, the, and your lifeline won't run back down towards the back, you're buggered as well. And, and that was where, as simple as it sounds, that guy in France, you may remember this, Mark, um, I've forgotten his name, yeah, he had yeah. that like foot strop, like prussic loops for climbing, and it's just a light line with a foot strop in it with a clip, and it's kept with your harness. So if you're over the side and you can't get back on, you can clip that to the tow rail and you've got foot strops to put in your feet and give you a shimmy up. And that's really relevant because I, I've seen you, I've seen quite a few accounts now where people have, have dropped dead because they can't get back on the boat. You know, they're clipped on, they're hanging over the side. So what's your story, Mark? Look, I think in the first instance, I actually put a, um, a solid um, guardrail on the boat the whole way around at 80 centimetres. So I tend to find the normal lifelines with the wire pop useless. And I've got a bit of a gammy left leg. So I find that that solid rail, and I think they're like one and a quarter inch, it's quite solid, and it just completely changes it. And also the hand holes that I've got the um, on the uh, the cabin top and going up forward. So firstly, that's I find that really helpful. Um, secondly, when I wear a harness, I tend to wear it inside my, my wet weather gear, not over the top. I tend to find them very difficult to put on over the top. Whereas if you have them on inside, you put them very easily, you put your foul weather jacket over the top, and then your thing comes up inside the thing. I want to clip on there. And if you've got a bib, you might have to manoeuvre it a little bit, but that, that, that still works. The other thing I tend to find really helpful is that hang on, just I've let got... Me, hang on, let me, get, let me get this vision right. You've got your harness on inside your jacket. You've got the lifeline yep. coming up under your jacket from the bottom and clipped on. Yep. Yep. And so if you go over the side, it's gonna it's gonna rip the bottom of your jacket up. And you might be hanging down low, sort of thing, you know. Uh, is well, that right? If you go over the side, the jacket's gonna be. You probably want to get it off anyway. Um, yeah. And uh, <laughs> but the, okay. The issue is it's keep it because because here's the issue. If if I have it on. Under my jacket, it means I, I I can have it on all the time. If I've got if I've got sort of long you know long underwear on or whatever, it, it's on. I can sleep in it and whatever. And if I need to go on the upper deck, I can clip on immediately. If I need to put a jacket on, I can put a jacket on. So what that means is is you're a lot more likely to have it on. Um, and and and, I'm, and 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 whereas if you're trying to wrestle it on. Over a jacket, I just tend to find it that almost impossible. It's an, the other, it's the interesting. Other, oh, sorry, the interesting oh, point. Oh, Very oh, few oh, jackets oh. now have have an inbuilt harness like they used to have, eh? Because everyone now wearing inflatable life jacket safety harness, and they don't rate the, yeah. in, the 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 harness inside your jacket for normal racing. But I always found that was really cool. I'm with you, Robin. You know, I've got, I've got so many wet weather gear sets with Busto. By the way, they bought me for 25 years of them with um, with the clip inside the jacket, which is kind of cool. <laughs> the other thing I, I tend to find really helpful is, as well as the um, the high guard rails, is that I've got um, running back stays, and when the running back stays are forward, the line to bring them back actually sits quite high up, and it's an additional line that's that's high. That if you're going up the leeward side, there's a line there, something to push against or hold onto, and then when when they're back. The line to take it forward is similarly another high line going um, that way. So I tend to find that the lines that pull the running back stays forward or aft are just additional lines that sort of box you in a little bit. And if there's some yeah. tension on them, it actually provides a little bit of um, something to grab on if you need to. Yeah, okay. So you didn't you didn't have a helmet either, did you? No. <laughs> well, and what I did was yeah. a number of 
a number of people picked on me because they said, oh, you've got all these bolts on your deckhead um, because we put in these hanging knees so we couldn't put the deckhead lining back in and we've got all these bolts on the, um, on the uh, clutches. And, they, and so we ended up getting these big foam things that we cut holes out a patch and we stuck them up there on either side. So I've, I've got an anti-helmet. The whole boat is a helmet for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I carried a helmet. I've still got the same helmet from 1990. And I, of course, when I got the Roll 360, I wasn't wearing it. Uh, but then I'd wear it out in the cockpit quite often sometimes when I was out there. But then the only injury I got during the – oh, I had a couple of little ones. But the big one was I got a sheet whacked in the ear in this year and it's now I've lost 60% in this year or something and I wasn't wearing a helmet then either so <laughs> right. anyway did you get any injuries in your travels Robin like have you had any uh, injuries at all touch wood yeah I've okay. been pretty lucky um, yeah yeah no I, I really haven't had it I've, I've, I've never had any injuries I've had a few cuts and bruises and a lot of bangs and bumps but you know nothing yeah. that's 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 worthy of writing home about. The only thing I did get once was I I I think I got a a, a, a grit from the, the the sanding on the deck got into a nick in my knee, and uh, yeah. went septic and blew up into a into a, a, a great big pus ball and all kinds of stuff like that. Oh, that that was kind of pretty uncomfortable for a while and and slowed me down, but. Uh, Apart from that, no, I've I've been very very lucky. Yeah, did you get any injuries, Mark? No, the only the only thing that that marked me around a little bit was because we started basically um, in in north in the summer and then went through the tropics and went across the equator and then the sun was following us down and whatever. So we were warm for a long period. It meant that I didn't wear shoes or I didn't wear socks for a, a long time. You know, for the first six weeks. And sitting in the companionway combing the whole time with my foot, my feet down lower meant that the blood tended to pull and whatever, and I tended to get swollen feet. Yeah. So I had to rig up these jack stays to try and elevate my legs and whatever. But when, when I found it got colder <laughs> and I started to wear socks and boots, I went away. <laughs> right. so, wouldn't it be funny if there's some Amoka guys listening to this conversation <laughs> I'll be saying what on earth are these guys talking about it's a really it's an amazing one and we just we're just about to bail out we've been on for nearly an hour right and we've only got to number seven so there's another another eight to go so it's right for two weeks time but, it, but one of the amazing things about the Amokas from the uh Arctic race they had the qualifier for the Vendée was that they've now hit a bit of a wall because the with the foils and the boats they're driving so hard we knew you know I can't imagine what it would be like in those boats going full stick you know 30 knots crashing into the waves all that sort of stuff and now the skippers are starting to say wow we can't live on the boat you know it's so violent they've got to sit in their chair but when they're at max performance and max speed and all that stuff the pilot is really just about it, you know, and they've got to detune to go and do something that is is involved with looking after themselves. So, so it's not, it, you know, forget the financial wall and forget about the performance thing. Now it's getting to the limit of human endurance. What do you think about that, Robin? I I I, I think that's that that's probably exactly right. I mean, they're, they're, I I can well imagine that. You know, there's there's one level of boat performance when you're actually sat there, you know, monitoring everything and sailing the boat. And then there's going to have to be a different level, a slower level of performance when you walk away to have a sleep or to cook some food and your attention is not, you know, wholly one 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 hundred percent on the um, uh, on on the boat. I mean, it, it, it it's a bit like, you know, you, you've got one level of performance you know, when we're steering, you know, sailing our boats with our steering gears, you could have a quite a lot better level of performance if you were actually on the helm doing it. Now, I wouldn't have a better level of performance because I'm not that good a helmsman, but a good helmsman could make a big, big difference. But as soon as that, as soon as, you know, you leave the helm and go back to the steering gear to do your, you know, do your steering, then the, the whole performance of the boat changes. So from our point yeah. of view in our race, you know, we, we would presumably optimise a lot of our sailing to be, you know, the, the best that the steering gear could do rather than the best that we could do if we were doing the steering. 
Yeah, well, the Amokas now, they're just mind-blowing. They're fantastic to watch, and it's going to be an amazing Bond Day this year. But, um, you know, you, you basically can't hand-steer them anymore. You know, they're not meant to be hand-steered. It's all autopilots. And, of course, that's rolled over now to the ocean race, which used to be fully crewed. Now it's fully crewed plus uh, autopilot, you know, because the, the Mokas are basically, you can't, you can't steer them, you know, but they're incredible, you know, quite something. But talk about cheese and chalk, that's probably um, – we should sign off because people will be wanting to go to bed or go and cook a, cook something or – and it might get night time and that will be dark, you know, or it could be a big fuss ball on your knee, you know. You never know what's going to happen in suburbia. Are you, so, yeah, are you sure there's anyone out there? <laughs> I don't know. How many we got? How many are watching still now, Dean? Four? Yes, bacon and eggs time. <laughs> Oh, okay. Anyway, she's saying, yeah, got to get off. Everyone's disappearing. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for your time. And we'll uh, we'll do it all again in two weeks. So, uh, and we'll get through the rest of the list. The rest, of the, I'll say the best till last. So it's going to get some up close and personal stuff later, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's it. So thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Robin. We'll see you in two weeks, eh? Yeah. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Mark. See you soon. Take care. Keep up the jigsaw yeah, puzzle. We'll see you later. Thank you, Robin. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Yep. And uh, thanks. Yep. Oh, a lot of fun. Okay. Look, yeah. Oh, slow start. We got in, interesting in the end. So we'll uh, we'll do it again in two weeks and see what happens. Thanks for that. And I'll uh, I'll be seeing you because I'm still here. You know, we got meetings later <laughs> on. So <laughs> see you later. <laughs> okay. So that's it for uh, our first session of three silly solo seniors. Bit of a bit of an epic that. But anyway. Thanks a lot and we'll see you again next week.